Hi, I'm Jeff Farnwald, director of the MBA program at Rockford University. About 18 months ago, the Rockford Chamber of Commerce set out to make networking easier in Rockford by identifying area people you should know in business. Currently, 41 people have been recognized and celebrated as one of these people. This series of talks held at Rockford University was designed to provide a vehicle for the public to hear from and learn about each of the people you should know. I hope you enjoy this talk. To introduce John J. Morrissey, who is president of Staff Management Incorporated, Market Dimensions Incorporated, and M Power HRIS Solutions Incorporated. These organizations are among the community leaders in providing human resource management, payroll, and related solutions to businesses across northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin. Together with John Morrissey Accountants, these organizations comprise the, fam the Morrissey Family Businesses, a family-owned enterprise headquartered in Rockford that is dedicated to providing quality <coughs> business solutions based on quality business relationships. John is a certified public accountant with more than 25 years of business, financial, and Fortune 500 executive management experience. Hello, welcome. He has developed a broad expertise in accounting, management, financial analysis, payroll, human resources, and business strategy. His leadership, enthusiasm, creativity, and problem-solving abilities are, demonstra are demonstrated every day in the variety of challenges posed by clients, colleague professionals, and these growing enterprises. He is quick to share his professional experiences in service to the community. He has his BSBA in accounting from Crichton University. He has been on, he has been the board of directors uh, for Northwest Bank of Rockford, 1998, and the Foresight Financial Group IT and Loan Committee, 2010 to the present. He is um, part of the Rockford Health System Director, um, Rockford Memorial Development Foundation. He was director in 2008, vice chair 2010 to 2012, chairperson from 2012 to 2014, <coughs> Light of the World Evangelical Ministries Director in 2011, Boylan High School Campaign Cabinet 2010 and Strategic Planning Committee 20, 2007 to 2010, if I can only talk, I'm sorry. E each week I think this is going to get easier and it never does. <laughs> um, he's gotten the Veritas Award recipient from Boylan High School um, in 2014. He was also the 2014 Rockford Chamber of Commerce 20 People That You Should Know. John's married and has two children. Please help me welcome John Morrissey. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks to all of you, too. Uh, there, there is uh, rarely anything more awkward than having somebody to read uh, a bio. You're like, oh, that's not that important. That's not critical. Uh, but, uh, uh, but thank you for doing that, Michelle. It's hard. Especially I, I scratched out a number of things. Well, that's not important. I took some of these things out as we went through. Uh, let me begin by uh, thanking uh, uh, Rockford University, and particularly the Graduate Program School, for the invitation to come this morning. Uh, let me thank as well the uh, Rockford Chamber of Commerce for their People You Should Know program. That's kind of what got me here, I guess. How many of you have been to the uh, to this series uh, from Among the People You Should Know? Most of you. Good. So none of you are here to see me. I like that. That's terrific. <laughs> I did make a few notes for myself. I'm probably going to refer to these a little bit as we go. But uh, I, I had a chance to introduce myself to most of you as you came in. To the extent we can make this time together, half hour, 45 minutes or so, a dialogue, I'm happy to do that. And so if something I say catches your fancy or, or, or bothers you in a way that says, hang on a second, let's talk about that, I'm more than happy to, to, to have you uh, uh, interrupt me and, and we'll go from there. Okay? So uh, I've got an agenda, I've got an idea where I'd like to carry the talk. I was afraid that if I didn't, I'd be done too quickly. So, uh, but, but, but please interrupt me, and to the extent we can make this a dialogue, I'd be happy with that. Uh, to a large degree, how many of you even heard what the topic, my topic was today? Anybody? <laughs> some of you? Um, to, that's all right. <laughs> to, to, some, to some large degree, I think I've, I've spilled the candy in the lobby, right? Because the, the topic for my talk, in so many ways, is the talk, right? Uh, it should mean a little bit of something to everybody, and I hope we get a chance to explore with everybody what, what you got. The topic that I chose for today was, they're not employees, they're people. That's the talk. I feel a little bit like a pastor uh, who uh, gets up to give his sermon, 
and, re, and, uh, and like, that's it. That's all I've got. That's, and if you don't get the message from that, you know, anything I add uh, will, will perhaps detract from the message. But like most pastors, I'm going to keep talking for a while. <laughs> uh, I, I'm hopeful. So, so I guess what I thought I would do is share a little bit of background about myself, then take that topic. Let me explore down three or four roads. Uh, I'd love to hear from you what, what you hear, what you feel when you get that idea about they're not employees, uh, they're people. So that's, uh, that's where I thought we'd go, and again, we'll have some dialogue. Michelle read through the bio. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually more simply summarized this way. Right now, it happens to be uh, 17, 17, and 17 for me. I was 17 years here in Rockford, uh, up through my high school years. I was 17 years away from Rockford, uh, and now I've been back for 17 years. And for you math majors, yeah, that adds up way, way too fast. Um, but but I've, been, I've been back at home running, uh, working with our family businesses for 17 years. Uh, my, my time away was spent in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, New York City, Sioux City, Iowa, Sydney, Australia, uh, and then back to Sioux City before I found my way home. While I was uh, off in those exotic locales, I was uh, exploring my uh, roots as an accountant first, and then eventually I joined Gateway 2000, a computer company some of you have, might be familiar with, the older ones in the group might be familiar with, uh, an international marketer of PCs and cow-spotted sundries. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw this yes yesterday, it was what, Cow Appreciation Day over at Chick-fil-A. You wouldn't believe the number of cow-spotted things I could probably find in my wardrobe for, uh, to help me out over at Chick-fil-A, but I missed, I missed it until about 9 o'clock last night. It was too late. That, so some of what I've picked up career-wise, I, I did pick up... Hi, welcome. I, I did pick up over the years at, at my time at Gateway a much larger organization, a Fortune 500, uh, and, and including, uh, again, my stint in Sydney, Australia, where I had kind of full charge of our, of our operation, Gateway Australia. But honed, again, a little bit better over the last uh, 17 years as I returned home. I am an accountant by background and training, but now I spend most of my time in our HR and payroll worlds. And, and so it's, it's that HR element that leads me to talk a little bit about uh, they are, uh, they're not employees, they're people. I stole the, the title of the presentation from Peter Drucker. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Peter Drucker, kind of uh, considered the founder of modern management. Uh, I think he passed away, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago now, I suppose, after a long and distinguished, I, did I move? I moved so you couldn't see me, sorry for that. Uh, a long and distinguished career as an author, educator, a writer, and really, again, the founder of modern management. He wrote this article in uh, 2002, uh, uh, and it was published in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, later that year, he, he got the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This is a, uh, a secular thinker in the world of what's happening in business, what's changing in business. And this article, and particularly the title of the article, it's kind of fascinated me since I first learned of it now, you know, a dozen, 15, a dozen 13 years ago. So I wanted to try to, to go a little bit with, with uh, four different avenues that I've got in mind that might make some sense as I take this thing. Let's start with, let's start with the reason he wrote this article in the first place. Uh, he was talking at the time about trends in outsourcing human resource functions. This is one of our businesses. Staff management is an, is an outsourcer of HR functions, and that's what brings the article to my attention in the first place. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about our business. That's not really the point uh, here. Drucker spoke about uh, outsourcing HR and, unsurprisingly, why I found the article I liked it, concluded that companies have ample reasons to try to do away with the routine chores of employee relations, whether by systematizing employee management in-house or uh, outsourcing it to a PEO, a professional employer organization. But they need to be careful that they don't damage or destroy relationships with people in the process. Indeed, the main benefit of decreasing paperwork may be to gain more time in people relations. The argument that he highlights, I thought was, was pretty clear and compelling. Again, I had read some of his stuff before. He says, to the extent that you get involved when you're working with an employee, so you get involved with talking about uh, what's in the employee handbook, um, 
uh, which policy they violated or didn't violate by wearing the wrong color shoes, uh, you're missing a key element of your relationship with, with an employee that has to do with understanding who they are, what motivates them, what moves them, what's going to make them a better employee. And, and, and if, you, if you fail to meet them at that level, you're missing it. That was really the, the, the crux of his whole article. If any of you would like it, I'll take a, uh, have a business card or get your name, uh, email. I will email you a link to the whole article. Happy to do that. Why? Well, uh, part of it was the, the increasing complexities we see in the workforce, right? We've, we've got regulations coming out virtually every orifice uh, that says we have to do it this way and that way and the next way. Uh, and however your political leanings and what you love or don't like about the Affordable Care Act, what you love or don't love uh, about family medical leave, uh, uh, the idea of, of lots of paid holidays, lots of paid sick time, lots of paid maternity leave, a year off with your kids, however you feel about that politically, recognize it is new regulation and somebody has to then measure it, manage it, take care of it, work through it. And Drucker's point, I think, well stated was, it makes sense to think about outsourcing some of those pieces. But he continued, and I, and I liked this. He says, it's one thing for a company to take advantage of long-term freelance talent or to outsource its more tedious aspects of HR management. It's quite another to forget that in the process, that developing talent, developing talent is business's most important task. Developing talent is business's most important task. His words, I love them, the sine qua non of competition in a knowledge economy. Sine qua non, I remember a little bit of my uh, high school Latin, without which there is nothing. Okay? Without developing talent, don't bother being in business. You have nothing. The sine qua non of, of what you're trying to achieve in business is developing talent. Drucker's thoughts. And if you spend your time and energies as a supervisor, as a boss, as a uh, business owner, picking on the little stuff and miss the developing talent, well, shame on you for one. And number two, you're doing it wrong, right? You're doing it wrong. Uh, and I appreciated that. Uh, why else? Well, the, the threat of lawsuits, right? Uh, we, we live in a litigious uh, society uh, and and for every regulation that I might name that takes up some time in the HR world the uh, you know American with Disabilities Act Family Medical Leave Act the Age Discrimination and Employment Act for every one of those regulations I can name I can also find a large body of work in the in the court systems that say aha and and folks who have rightly in many cases taken up their cause against an employer and said that's not the way this is supposed to work where's my money I suspect there's some wrongly that got, that got to that spot as well, but, but for the most part, uh, they found employers not behaving themselves and taking advantage of the workers. So, uh, so I've, I've, I've long loved that idea of, of, the, of developing talent. By the way, it's hard to do. <coughs> hard to make happen all the time, make an everyday habit out of it, but I've loved that idea that developing talent is that sine qua non of, of, of competition in the knowledge economy. In fact, he continues, and I like this as well, if by offloading employee relations, organizations lose their capacity to develop people, they will have made a devil's bargain indeed. That capacity to develop people, critical to it. So, that's, so, so again, the first area from the, from the article really had to do with this outsourcing idea. It's like, look, get, get some of these pieces off your plate so that you can spend more time on the key parts of employee relations. And that's where I really wanted to, to spend uh, kind of the second piece. The, uh, the article also talks to this idea of a changing workforce. It, it says, I'll summarize this, I may read a couple of pieces of it, but uh, as recently as the 1950s, some 90% of the workforce was essentially uh, non-exempt, right? Th those folks that are working, uh, they're, they're, they're not uh, supervisors, managers, bosses. Some 90% of the workforce was non-exempt. They essentially did what they were told, or at least supposed to do what they were told. That was, that was the idea. You showed up to work for the purpose of doing what you're told. Exempt people, uh, supervisors, managers, the white collars, if you will, uh, 
uh, were the ones that typically had the education and, and the supposed to have had the developed sense of what to do and therefore were to tell the non exam what to do. I wasn't around in the 1950s, so if my picture of that isn't exactly right, forgive me for it. But that's the, 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 the essence of, you can see the shift, right? Now we have a situation where we've got uh, some 40% of the entire workforce being what Drucker coined as knowledge workers, right? Folks that use their professional expertise, their education, their experience to execute a function, not show up to work, do what you're told, and do this. I, I, I don't want to denigrate that role in the workforce. That's it's still a critical role. But as we've seen this shift, it seems to me, from uh, a, a group that's, you know, kind of power is held tightly and wielded over uh, a, a larger group, of, a larger mass, if you will, to a group where we're knowledge workers and people are expected to use their skills, ability, knowledge, skills, abilities, experience, education, et cetera, to make decisions, well, so ought your management style have to shift with that. And so again, I think it makes sense to go back to this idea that says, be careful. They're not employees, they're people. Huh? Uh, they are associates, they are colleagues, they are co-workers, not subordinates, not employees, not underlings, whatever, right? So, so even our, our language shifts a little bit in that regard. We essentially coined this idea of the knowledge worker. But it seems to me that with that shift, we now have to spend more of our time as, as I'll say, bosses, uh, understanding our workforce. Who are you? Why are you here? I've asked it in my spot, a couple of you have actually spent time in, in, in my organizations, uh, and I've asked the, these questions of people. Why do you work? Why do you work? I want you to understand your motivation. What, 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 why do you work? I'm, I'm perfectly okay with the idea that maybe the first reason, I need money, <laughs> right? I want to have a place to live, I want a car, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get my children educated, whatever that is, I need the money, okay. That may be a reason, it may even be the biggest reason, but I suspect that in many cases it's not the only reason. And as a business owner, I'd love to understand what are those other reasons? And, and how important are they to you? Well, you know, I, 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 th th this, is, this is my profession. I gain status from my work. I gain ego from my work. I gain... Uh, uh, I, I want the world to know my creative genius from my work. Whatever that is, I'd love to understand that motivation. So I have to understand the person and that motivation. I want to know what energizes somebody. Where do you draw your energy from? And how can I, as a partner to you, how can I, as a colleague, perhaps use that? That sounds... sounds Sounds nefarious, perhaps, and I don't mean it that way, but how can I work with that to say, if you and I are pulling the same direction and I know what turns you on, what motivates you, what energizes you, wh how you draw your energy, we could probably do better together. Better than if I just say, thanks for showing up this morning, there's the pile of work, go. Several organizations spend a fair bit of time on this exercise now, and, I, and, and while I haven't done it fully through my own organization, I applaud the efforts of those that have. They'll use uh, a Myers-Briggs type indicator, for instance, for everybody, right? Most of us might be familiar with Myers-Briggs, extrovert, introvert, thinker, feeler, intuitor, sensor. Judging and perceiving, thank you very much. Um, it, uh, and why do they do that? Well, it's to understand that worker, understand that colleague a little bit better. And in many cases, not just boss to, I'll, I'll choose my word, subordinate, boss to, right? But sometimes it's colleague to colleague in a way that says, this is how I have to approach this person if I want to get something done. This is how I have to, you know, if, if uh, Mary Beth and I did take the Myers-Briggs, this is my sister, Mary Beth, who was back in our organization. And I think our folks had us do this how many years ago? Teenagers? I didn't think it was that long ago, but okay. <laughs> okay maybe one, of the things we, one of the things we learned about each other, 
Can I share? Do you mind? Sure. Right. Uh, on that scale of thinking, feeling, right? Are you all familiar with Myers Briggs? Okay, so I'm not talking a crazy foreign language. Uh, it, it takes those four pieces, ext extrovert, introvert, and puts them on a continuum and says, where are you along that continuum? So extrovert, introvert, thinker, feeler, uh, uh, sensor, uh, accountants would be sensory, um, uh, I don't know, en engineers might be sensory, who'd be, who'd be intuitive, uh, movie makers maybe, very intuitive folks perhaps, I don't know. But they're all on these continuum. Well, one of the things we found out as Mary Beth and I both did this thing was uh, we were mostly kind of down the middle except in one category, thinker, feeler. Me? Dominated by thinker. My sister, not so much. <laughs> Dominated by feeler. We actually uncovered, I think, the source of some of our teenage angst. Uh, <laughs> we just didn't like each other. Well, we didn't think about things the same way. Yeah, yeah stop that. Yeah, just... <laughs> if you'd have thought about it, you wouldn't have liked me. I can promise you that. I found that helpful to understand a little bit about her world view. And, and I'm grateful that, that again, my, my mother, who was active in, in the HR uh, world developing that, was, was pushed us to, to, to get that because I think understanding the world view of a colleague <laughs> or a subordinate starts to help you understand who they are, what they are, where they're coming from, and puts you closer of a mind to say they're not employees. They're people, yeah? Uh, Myers-Briggs happens to be one of them. It's an, it's an oldie but a goodie, we'll say. Uh, there, are, there are dozens, I suspect, of others. The, the, the colors, right? Uh, I'm a blue, you're a gold. Uh, I did that one with my, with my uh, wife and daughter. Uh, uh, my daughter, well, she was what, maybe 15, we went through this, uh, and is convinced that because I'm a gold and she's a blue, I will never, ever understand her. Uh, as a 15-year-old kid, I'm sure I wasn't going to understand her much anyways. And at 19, it's only marginally better. <laughs> but whether it's Myers-Briggs or, again, the colors or whatever other approach, I think there's some value to seeing some of those trends in the workplace to understand, especially knowledge workers, especially those who are expected to do a professional job uh, to do things. So uh, 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 we could also go, there's a whole bunch of research on the generational differences in the workforce, right? Uh, boomers and millennials and Gen X and Gen Y and native, n uh, digital native is my favorite new one, the people that grew up digitally native. Question? Didn't you talk about the 40% now that we call knowledgeable? Knowledge workers. Knowledge workers. Are they automatically supervisor or could they also be not supervisor but just because of, you know, we educated? Yeah, Cindy, that's a... That's a very good question, Cindy. Uh, no, I don't think that as, uh, certainly as I use the term, but I don't think as Drucker intended the term that, that knowledge worker necessarily meant supervisor. There came out a nice body of work that, that, that tried, in fact, to encourage bosses to say, look, some people will be better as team leaders. They, or in other words, they have a, a skill or a sense about them that helps them develop people, and others uh, are, are better suited as individual contributors, right? So the person who is exceptionally good, let, 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 I'll use an engineer, uh, I probably shouldn't because I don't know that much about engineering, I suppose, but some people will be a very good engineer and you wouldn't dream of putting them in charge of a team of engineers, right? Because that's just not how they're built. And other people may in fact be marginally capable engineers, but have a management you know, bone in their body that says, I, but I know how I can get a team of people to get the job done. Uh, and so, so no, I don't think the knowledge worker necessarily meant supervisory, mm -hmm. but it did mean, uh, and again, remember some of this writing is now even, you know, pushing 15 years old, 20 years old. Uh, it meant that I was, I was using more of, of, of mind and less of fingers, right? Uh, less of just going to the factory Chick, 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 right. So, so that that became that nod. That forty percent number may very well be higher today, and I think uh, I think the research would suggest that that's one of the challenges that you that the U.S. has faced is that shift, kind of a dramatic 
and reasonably quick shift away from some of that. It has led to outsourcing of, of factory type jobs to uh, Asia and Central America. Uh, uh, again, good, bad, or otherwise, but it's, it's, it's made some, for some dramatic shifts in our economy. Sure. I'm sure this comes up in uh, conversations even with colleagues and other businesses. In your experience, do people kind of, uh, when they are approached with the idea of getting to know their workers in that fashion, is there more of a disbelief that that's actually something that will affect the bottom line, or <laughs> is it just a difficulty in knowing how to actually utilize that tool and harness that energy? I don't know. Uh, that, 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 that's, an, that's an excellent question. How do we take the, uh, and, and all right. you've, heard the, uh, you've heard the phrase that uh, uh, to a man with a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail, right? Okay, uh, because if that's, if that's the tool I have, then the whole world looks like a problem to be solved. Oh, I'm an accountant. So I, I, I do have this sometimes dogged focus on a bottom line for a business, mine or for a client. And it is difficult sometimes to draw a line from that bottom line back up through an organization to say, you know, uh, yeah, but were you nice to your colleagues today? Do you understand who your colleagues are? Do you, uh, that, that, that's not an easy or straight line. Or even placement too, I'm sure, to say whether or not that was the right person for that right. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's right. So, uh, and the other piece that, that Drucker spent a fair bit of his time uh, researching and writing about was management by objective, right? So this whole idea of, of, of sitting with an employee, setting goals, smart goals, right? Specific, measurable, et cetera. We've, we've all seen most of those things. It is largely born out of some of Drucker's work that says we're, we're going to set objectives here, targets, goals, uh, all of which were then designed to say, yeah, let's get this to the bottom line. D Drucker uh, then and still has his detractors that say uh, we shouldn't have spent as much time focusing on, on those kind of management, that kind of management by objectives. As a pure capitalist, you might argue bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, bottom line. That's how, how do I get to the better bottom line? I think, and this was, I'll, I'll jump to what one of the conclusions I was going to get to at the very end of my discussion is this. I think it's important that you understand the role that other people have in, an, in your organization and work to that end. The example I, that comes to mind as we're talking about it uh, is probably a, a Henry Ford. And, and, and I, I know about you th this much about it, right? So I don't mean to disparage Ford or the family or the company. But he didn't, I don't think, as, 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 I, as I've done some of my reading, I don't think his approach to using people in his organization was really necessarily very magnanimous. It was, I can get people to do this manufacturing job faster, easier, cheaper than I can go build robots, mechanicalized things to do these things. He understood that for a production line to progress and for him to make money at the bottom line, he needed people to do menial, repetitive tasks. If that's your business, I, I won't begrudge you that says, I understand that's what they need to do, that's the role they need to play, that's why I hire them, this is what I pay them, <coughs> this is how we negotiate for that pay, benefits, et cetera. Fine, fair. But I think we, we if, if we're not, and, and again, as you said, that drives a, a bottom line piece with that. I think sometimes that management style bleeds over into organizations, I'll say, like, like, like mine, like ours, that, that, that is uh, professional accountants, uh, human resource management, consulting, advice. And if I treat workers that same way, it's a poor fit for the business. Can I draw that to the bottom line? Well, I hope I can. Uh, I think I can, but more by, uh, more by years of experience, perhaps, than, than trying to draw a a, uh, a research-driven, if you do this, then this, then this. I try to draw it to the bottom line by saying, look, over the course of years, that approach to people helps us with uh, developing people, uh, retaining the people we want to retain in an organization, uh, not retaining those that you don't want to retain in the organization. 
uh, and even understanding where the, where you get misses, right? So there are people you'd like to retain that you don't, and there's people that you'd like that you wouldn't like to retain, and you sometimes do. To to our detriment, but that that happens. That's a good question. Uh, how that ties to the bottom line? Let, uh, it's 20 minutes to one. Uh, I I, I want to hit some more questions. Let me hit two more points real quickly. On the way this idea of they're not employees, they're people has hit me. Uh, looking uh, the third category, I think, is looking through the employee handbook, right? And, and saying, I don't want to look at you as an employee. I want to think about the people side. We had this circumstance in our organization. Again, we manage HR for several other companies. Employee calls up, says, I'm not going to make it into work today, or at least I'm going to be pretty late. Oh, OK. Why? What's, what's going on? Well, uh, uh, well, um, I'm being arrested at the moment. I guarantee you there's nothing in your handbook that says, here's what to do if one of your employees is being arrested and can't make it to work. I prove me wrong. I didn't think so. Your employee handbook isn't going to help you with that situation. As a boss, what do you say? What do you do? And I'll suggest right away, you don't treat them as an employee. You try to understand their personal situation. Now, you're also going to spend some time figuring out what's the impact on my business today because they're not making it. What's my impact on my business tomorrow when maybe I have to try to figure out, you know, did they get out uh, uh, for the day? What were they in for? What, what, what were they being charged? Right? I mean, think, think of it. Where does your mind go? You know, a person with some bad parking tickets that caught up with them and they're being arrested, and, uh, depending on your commission, you go, whatever. Don't let it happen again. You missed work. Stop it, right? person who hurt somebody and <laughs> your mind goes different places and I guess my encouragement is you cannot spend your energies as a boss thinking of that as an employment situation first you need to think of it as a, a human situation similarly when we're faced with uh, uh, illnesses in the workplace physical mental illnesses uh, employee that says you know I'm having panic attacks Okay, well, that, that, that's real. I, I get that. Uh, what's the impact to the business? What's the impact to clients? What's the impact to what's going on? But at some level, it's also, how, how can I help you get well, healthier? What, what role is the business playing or stresses that are here playing? You have to, in my view, look at them as people, not just employees. So that's the third area that I, my mind goes to with that. And the last quick area is this. I, I guess I, I've, I've taken to calling it a, a kind of a personally integrated management idea, right? I choose to spend a fair bit of my life, my working, my, my waking hours at work. I choose to do that. Not everybody does choose to do that, but I do. And, and I don't think it's right or fair for me to say, that's who I am at work, and this is who I am outside of work. I think it's important that we work towards greater integration of ourselves, greater integrity, greater integral, you know, getting, getting these forces to, to make sense one against the other. Okay? So uh, it seems to me, and, and I, I come from a, uh, a, a, a tradition of faith that's important to me. Doesn't matter which faith, frankly, but because most of them teach love at some level. I think it's reasonable when I hear they're not employees, they're people. It's a reminder to me, it's an exhortation to me that says, don't make this all about work. Look through to the situation, love first, and then sort through whatever, the, whatever challenges that might create. Those were the four areas that I thought I'd spend my time talking about. It's now a quarter to one. I did promise that I would wrap up to the point that uh, let you all get back to your uh, to your desks at, at one o'clock. I am happy to stick around for a little bit and ask uh, answer whatever questions you may have, or at least make fun of you for asking them. <laughs> if you have questions now, or would like to further the conversation, or or share with me something else that hits hits you when you hear they're not employees, they're people, I'd love to hear it from you. I'd love to.